So today I want to do things a little bit differently. A few months ago, while I was deep into researching Edwardian boots, I became obsessed with the idea of acquiring some real antique boots for reference, study, and simply stare at. I needed something beyond a museum setting that I could inspect closely, open it up, really get a feel for the proportions and a closer look at the construction techniques that they used on these shoes. I will say traditional shoemaking now is pretty much the same as it was then in terms of construction techniques and materials, but still I want to get a closer look at the specifics. The Balmoral boot was originally a men's style designed for Prince Albert in the mid 19th century. It is said that Queen Victoria took a liking to her husband's shoes and had several commissioned making her the first woman to wear the style. These beautiful Balmoral boots made of the thinnest kid leather feature a black vamp, also known as foxing, also known as goloche, and a brown boot shaft folded edges at the top line and at the vamp, a pointy toe, although I consider it to be a bit of an almond as well, so a pointy almond, and a mock toe, meaning the stitching creates the illusion of a cap toe without it being a separate piece of leather, and it features a very delicate broguing detail. Broguing is a series of decorative holes punched into the leather. It's a brilliant example of the tiniest stitching seen throughout the entire boot. The toe puff is very stiff and the counter is very stiff, but the rest of the boot is much softer. This boot also features 18 of the most petite metal eyelets. The heel was one of the main reasons I chose this boot. It is a stacked leather Louis heel. Stacked leather heels require more care and are more work for the shoemaker in comparison to a wrapped wooden heel. This type of heel is created by pasting each layer one at a time and shaping it. It takes practice and in particular, a curvy Louis heel can be especially tricky to achieve. Additionally, there is the presence of metal heel plates, nickel in this case I believe, which serves two purposes. One, for aesthetics. <laughs> two, perhaps more importantly, is to provide protection to the stacked heel. One can find this plate sandwiched between the top lift and the heel, so that as the top lift begins to wear away, damage won't be done to the actual stacked heel. This is relevant still today, even though most shoes don't have metal plates. Always be sure to keep an eye on the heels of your shoes and get top lifts replaced before further damage is done. This is a quick and easy fix for your local cobbler that will add more life to your shoes. Another reason why I chose these was the curvy arch and overall proportions. In my opinion, these boots are a beautiful example of a well-balanced design. The curves are just right, the arch is properly outlined, creating a neat, smooth line into the heel breast, and the heel is aligned perfectly under the foot. This little line here lets me know that the shoes have been stitched, not just cemented. A channel is cut slightly with a knife all the way around, peeled back stitched all the way and then glued back down. It sort of just peeled through time. The lining is natural cotton twill with natural leather facings. Unfortunately this leather hasn't aged well and it is very brittle so I'm inspecting it very gently but luckily the lining came with a happy surprise and it has a hole which normally I know would be a bad thing. In my case it's a good thing. I was able to peel it back ever so gently and was able to see the back seam is covered by a piece of cotton tape and stitched on which serves the same function as reinforcement tapes we use today. When it came to dating the boot, I obviously did some research on the internet, but Nazim from Shoe Icons actually messaged me and told me that this book had been one of the best resources that he's used to help him date the shoes in his vast collection. I highly recommend you check it out if you're into vintage shoes, but you're here, so I'm assuming you are. So I'll link below his virtual museum. It really is a treat. So this is the book that he recommended. It's called Women's Shoes in America from 1795 to 1930, written and illustrated by Nancy E. Rexford. So I'll, if I can find it, I'll link that below as well. So this book has been a wonderful wonderful investment i love it i think it's beautiful it encompasses basically the eras that i enjoy working with 
so it's it's perfect for me and my taste in particular but also because it shows the most delicious illustrations of shoes from the different periods with details and embroidery and bows and all the buttons and laces and just I could go on. When attempting to date these boots, the book refers to front lacing styles coming back into fashion in 1915 after years of button boots in particular being the dominant style between 1910 and 1914. Noting, the shorter skirts of the mid-teens encouraged the adoption of higher boots, a trend that was fully established by 1917, when 9 inch boot tops became the standard. Balmoral boots, 7 to 9 inches high, referring to the boot top, not the heel height, with pointed toes, were typical between 1917 through 1923. In terms of the heel, which was another clue to look at when dating shoes, by 1917, the flared Louis heel predominated and it appeared on dressy boots as well as shoes, but by 1923, the Louis heel declined in popularity. So we can safely assume that these boots fit right into that date range between 1917 and 1923, and hopefully someday I'll get a more accurate date. So that's it friends, that is my absolute favorite pair of antique boots. I'm hoping to acquire some more later down the road. I want to get some button boots too, man, there's so many. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed this video, I'll see you guys next time, bye.